Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. When I used to talk to my kids about that, I used to say, hey, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That means that he is the answer to all things. He's the way, he's the truth, he's the answer to all things. And they'd say, yeah, okay, Dad. Yeah, okay, Dad. Today I was at an uh, end overdose march and rally. We started at, uh, at the church, the Methodist church there on 17th Street in Maine, and parked and kind of got organized. It was a little bit like herding cats, but it wasn't too bad. And uh, got organized there and marched down Main Street all the way to the uh, park that's right across the street from City Hall. So that's like 18, 19 blocks. And 300 people or so, uh, both sides of the street. And it went really, really, really well. Uh, at the rally, um, some folks got up and talked and shared some thoughts. And one of the One of the guy's son died 40 days ago or so, uh, OD'd locally, and he talked. And as he talked about how that kid had every advantage a kid could have. I mean, he was in a nice home. He was in a good school. They had money. They, what, what are you saying, Luke? They had money, uh, all, all, of, all of that kind of thing, but addiction doesn't discriminate. And that monster is going to come call him. Prison, rehab, lots of fights, lots of arguments, lots of soul searching, lots of hand wringing. I'm listening to him tell the story and I thought, this is my story. Only my son's not dead yet. But he's in prison. Meth put him there. Two counts of assault with a deadly second go around for him and so my wife and I have been through that ringer but I haven't stood on steps yet with the sun in the ground and talked about it that way Jesus is the answer Reminded me of a story as well, one that's in scripture. So let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 18. If you don't have a Bible, we got some for you. John 18, chapter 18, going to be in verse 33. Now, just to give you a little bit of context, Jesus has been arrested. And so he's coming before Pontius Pilate. Now, we remember Pontius Pilate as being a bad guy. And if you uh, don't remember that from Sunday school class, you know that from the old Rolling Stones song. So either way, you know that Pontius Pilate is a bad guy. So in verse 33, it says, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. Now, Jesus was bound, and he said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? And Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate says, what is truth? What is truth? Isn't that what we're still after? 
Isn't that what all the arguments on TV are about? Isn't that what all of the Republicans and the Democrats and the congressmen and the Senate and the Muslims and the non-Muslims and the Catholics and the Protestants and the unsaved and the saved and any division of people group you can think of, isn't that the question, what is true? Because if we could all agree on what truth is, we wouldn't be arguing about it. We'd be getting stuff done. We'd be loving on one another. Well, we're of that day, so whenever we don't know what something is, we what? We Google it. So if you have your Google machine, open up Google and type in what is truth. What, your grandma will tell you you can't use your phone in church? She's probably right, but we, we could do it too. What is truth? And the first thing that I get is a definition. And it is from a Webster website, I believe. And so I'm not opening any of these. I'm just seeing kind of like what the menu says. And so uh, truth, the quality or state of being true. Now, I had a teacher way, 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 way back in the day that used to tell me that you can't define something by using the same word. That's not a definition. So if she said define blue, and I said, well, it's blue. She goes, you can't use blue to define blue. Explain to me blue. So Webster apparently had a different teacher because truth, the quality or state of being true, or that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. Okay. The fact or belief that is accepted is true. So what is truth, according to Webster? A fact or a belief that is accepted as true. So what is true? If it's a fact or accepted, so anything that's accepted becomes fact and that makes it true? As the world still argues. So as I scroll down a little bit, I get to a Wikipedia thing that talks about truth. Truth is most often used to mean being in accord with fact or reality. Usually means that. Doesn't have to, but usually means that. When I scroll down a little bit more, I get one from, uh, one from Philosophy News is going to talk about truth. It says, truth, like knowledge, is surprisingly difficult to define. Yeah, especially if you don't use the word in the definition. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit more, I get psychology today. What is truth? An overview of the philosophy of truth. So truth has a philosophy now. It's no wonder we can't figure out what truth is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Is it fair to say that Jesus was calling himself the truth? So when I, when I look up what the world tells me, the world's going to define truth by using the word and kind of, well, if a whole bunch of people agree, we're going to call it truth. The scripture says one thing. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. Now, you couple that with way and life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, then I say that means he's the answer to all things. Addiction does not discriminate. When I was looking around at that rally, I mean, red, yellow, black, and white. Anybody could think of. Well-dressed, not so well-dressed. There was people that had some tattoos on their arms, and there were some people that had so many tattoos, I felt like I should read them. Looked like a newspaper. But everybody was there. Everybody was there. You could tell by looking at their shoes. You could tell a rich man by looking at his shoes. You could tell a poor man by looking at his shoes. And every type of shoe you figure was there. Addiction does not discriminate. And so I'm thinking about what we've read. And let's go to verse 37 with what Jesus said to Pilate. At the end, it, so Pilate says, are you the king? And Jesus said, you say correctly. And, and he says, I am the king. I've been born for this. I've come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. And then he says this. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. 
everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate says, what is true? But listen to what Jesus said. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. In other words, everyone who is not of the truth does not hear my voice. Is that fair to say? Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Meaning, if you are not of the truth, then you don't hear my voice. Now, I'm, I'm struck with this, with this reality, okay, that addiction doesn't discriminate. That red, yellow, black, or white, rich, medium, poor, doesn't matter. That monster's coming if it hasn't already got there. Did Jesus just discriminate? Did Jesus just say, only some of you are going to hear the truth? Let's go to John 8, just a couple pages to the left. John 8. John 8, I'm going to start in verse 31. Just going to do five verses here. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. Now, he's not talking to Pontius Pilate at this point. Hasn't been arrested yet. He's talking to those that would follow him. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You realize that Jesus didn't have the gospel of John to give to them. Right? You realize that Jesus didn't have Romans in Peter, in the book of Acts, in Thessalonians, and the, the New Testament was be, has, wasn't even written yet, okay? So when Jesus says, if you abide in my word, he doesn't mean, he said, if you listen to what I'm telling you, if you listen to the, if you follow the example that I'm giving you, if you heed to the clues that I'm laying down, follow in my word. My word is these are the things that I express, live, and say. When we hear word, we think book. No. If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. You'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. They answered and said, we are Abraham's descendants that have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Now, Jesus said in John 14, a little bit later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is identifying himself as the truth. Now, prior to that statement, he says, if you continue in my word, if you continue following my actions, if you continue where I lead you, then you are truly disciples of mine, truly followers of mine. And then he says, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Jesus said, you will know the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus is the truth. You will know me. Later on, he says, same passage, he says, slave doesn't remain in the house forever, but the son does. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Can you see the correlation where he says, hey, I am the truth, and I'm also the son. So either one of those words, either one of those ideas that you want to use that gives you your freedom, understand both of those things are me. It's a hard thing for us to wrap our mind around, but so here I got, I, you're going to fill in the blank, okay? I like filling the blanks, Garland, when I was in school because the essay questions used to aggravate me. Fill in the blanks, I had, you know, a chance. So it was like this. Um, I look out the window and it's bright, okay? But I don't know what the temperature is. And so I walk outside and they go, man, the blank is hot today. The sun. Everybody agree? The sun is like 2 million miles away from earth. What, did I just walk right out into the sun? Or you walked out into the rays of the sun? 
you walked out to that thing that radiates from that heavenly body that's way over there thing. Yet we call it the same thing. That's the sun, and man, this is the sun. I got to get in and out of the sun. You were in the sun? Man, what ship did you use to get there? Right? Here's the way I think about it in my head so I don't get myself terribly confused. Jesus is the truth, capital T. The things that emanate from him, his word, the things that we're following, the example that we're seeing and trying to emulate, the things that radiate from him, the rays of the sun are truth, lowercase t. Fair enough? That makes sense? So when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, he is the source of the way. He is the source of the truth, just like the sun, S-U-N, is the source of the rays that make me go, man, where's the shade? Is that discriminatory? So Jesus being the truth, capital T, and what radiates from him, what, what filters down through his church, lowercase t. Does that discriminate? Did Jesus die on a cross for only a few? Did, did the rays that come from the sun only impact a few? Or the rays from the sun warm the whole earth. Jesus died on a cross for all mankind, all sins, all people. Red, yellow, black, and white. Rich, medium, poor. No matter what kind of shoes they're wearing, that blood covers the sins of those people. Now, what Jesus says in that verse 37, if you know the truth, then you'll be following me. What, they mean, what he means by that is, I gave you everything that I could possibly give. But if you reject it, then you're rejecting truth. And then you're doing this. Trying to find what true is. Trying to find what side of the argument you come down on. It's going to be a short night from a sermon standpoint. I hope that's okay. I love my son. I heard him say the words. I watched him get baptized when he was he was a uh, junior highish. We've had many conversations. He knows the right things to say. In many cases, he's had an advantage. But he's chosen so poorly over and over and over again. That I find myself in a place where all I can do is cry out at the altar of the sacrifice and say, Lord, hear my prayer. When I have the opportunity to speak with them, when to exchange letters and those types of things, you know, I, you, you're constantly playing this game of, I don't want to come across too holy, because then he just tears up the letter. And so you're trying to set these breadcrumbs out for him to eat a little and to eat a little and to eat a little. To get him, get him closer to that great banquet feast. That, you, know, you know what I'm talking about, right? That great banquet feast of grace. The, the part where the, 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 or the new Christian, they can't eat there yet. They can only have, you can like bring them a sandwich from that table. But they can't go to that table yet because it's so overwhelming that they would freak out and go the other direction. It's like I'm smuggling out crackers trying to give it to my son to entice him to this table. The 
then my phone rings, then it rings again, and then I get 16 emails, and then it rings some more, and then there's problems at the church, or there's problems at work, or there's problems with whatever. And I realize time goes by. I hadn't talked to him. I hadn't written him another letter. And then guilt comes in. Satan loves that. Oh, my gosh. Satan loves that, right? Get in there, dig that knife in. Dirty dog. And then I find myself at the foot of that altar of sacrifice all over again and saying, Lord, I can't do this. And he says, John, you never could. You never could. It was all you can do. It's know that I'm the truth. And I don't discriminate. I love your son as much as you love your son, probably more. And I'm not going to be mad at a one-legged man if he can't run. Because that's bipolar. He has a mental illness. There's times where he has no idea what he's doing. And I take comfort in the mercy and the grace that my God is good all the time. All the time. And it doesn't matter what he's done. It doesn't matter what he's said. It doesn't matter what he's rejected. I know that God is true. Capital T. And I'm going to stand on that. Lord, heaven, I love you. Lord, I pray for those folks that are rallying tonight, that are coming together in community tonight. Lord, I know that they have to, on the surface, kind of keep you in their back pocket, Lord. But Lord, I'm praying for them walls to come down because them walls are not true. Lord, I'm praying for your name to be shouted from the rooftops within that community. Lord, I pray for my son who's looking out a small little window somewhere. Lord, I pray that he recognizes that he'll never find peace until he settles at the base of your throne. Lord, I pray for these folks that are here. Lord, I feel like they're my family. Lord, I pray for their family, for their hearts and their minds, their strength. I pray for the path that they're going to walk tonight, tomorrow, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Lord, I pray that they would seek you for every step, that they would recognize that we need you all the way in, every, in everything that we do. with me as we move toward the table. Please stand.